I will introduce myself. I am Jenna Hoyt. I'm the 4-H educator in Ashtabula County, which is the most northeast county in Ohio, right on Lake Erie in between Cleveland and Erie, Pennsylvania. And I have been with OSU Extension going on 10 years. And as all of you right now, we are working from home. We are teleworking until basically until further notice with OSU. And we've been home since March 17th or thereabouts. And we anticipate hopefully going back in July. But a lot of our meetings have been held, or all of them have been held virtually since we've been working from home. So Morgan and I both have a wide variety and a diverse group of volunteers and again, stakeholders that we work with virtually um, during this time. And I'll let Morgan introduce herself as well. Good morning. So my name is Morgan Demokas. I am the 4-H educator in Medina County which is, um, if you know where Cleveland, Ohio is, I am in the county south of there. So not too far from Cleveland and Lake Erie as well. And um, I am excited to be here. I have enjoyed using Zoom since OSU first rolled it out. Um, I think it's been about three years. We, um, some of us were early adopters of this platform and I've been a huge advocate of it ever since we started using the free version. Um, Ohio State has since upgraded to a paid version for all of its um, staff and students and such. And so it's been really nice to get to utilize this, especially as Jenna said, since we've been working from home and this has been our primary mode of um, interacting with our colleagues uh, you know, across the state and across the country. So it's really been Nice. Um, I've been in this position for six years and, um, you know, just uh, really excited to share what we've learned about Zoom and um, some of the ways that we utilize it to help us in our uh, programs and organizations. And I want to take a minute just to thank Ann Bonner this morning um, with ODNR. She reached out to us and to the university and we're happy to partner with her and partner with you guys to offer this program today. So thank you, Ian, for your help in working with us to get this set up and communicating with all your contacts with ODNR and your stakeholders as well. So a couple features just as we get started, you can put things in the chat if you would like. Um, everyone is on mute right now. If you have questions and you wanna put them in the chat, that's great. We'll also kind of take some breaks, different points during the presentation for you to ask questions. And then we'll have a general Q&A at the end. So that's kind of just some good housekeeping. Everyone is muted right now, but you do have permission to unmute yourself if you would like. And we're gonna show you some of those other features throughout our time together here in about the next 45 minutes to an hour, show you how to raise your hand and, some of these virtual backgrounds that we've talked about and some other just kind of best practices when you're hosting virtual meetings. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, the first thing we wanted to talk to you a little bit about was how to use parliamentary procedure in your online meetings and the sunshine law and how that affects your conversations and what your meetings look like right now. So hopefully you are familiar with the sunshine law. If not, it is um, House Bill 557 which allows members of a public body, such as many of those that you work for or volunteer with, um, to attend meetings via teleconference or video conference during a public health state of emergency, such as we are in right now. But that has to be declared by the governor. And there are some great trainings that are available about the Sunshine Law on the Attorney General's website. And when Morgan and I were doing a little bit of research, we did see that there are some coming up in June um, some are virtual and I believe some are being held face to face as well. I'm sure that's probably going to change, but we encourage you to check out the Attorney General's website for more information as to the Sunshine Law and how you can use that more with your organization. And so just to uh, interject, I know that some folks are from outside of Ohio, so that is on the Ohio Attorney General's website. Um, and you know, I would encourage you if you are from outside of Ohio to check with your, um, you know, your attorney general to see what they have available as well. Um, the one that we know that is online coming up, um, you know, I don't know if it's limited to just Ohio residents or not, but, you know, definitely check Ohio's website as well if you'd like. Okay. 
Perfect. So a couple of things to remember when you're looking at holding a virtual meeting. First and foremost, you need to know the rules. So are you permitted, according to your organization's bylaws, to hold a meeting virtually by phone or online? And in some cases, that is not, you're not able to do that. So therefore, you may have to vote to suspend your bylaws temporarily. Um, and that's something using parliamentary procedure that you can do and Robert's Rules of Order. But that's something you need to kind of establish first and foremost before you go ahead and hold a meeting online. And then you want to think about where and how those meeting announcements are being posted and the connection information is being shared. Um, we've probably all seen stories about Zoom bombers, people coming and doing inappropriate things on Zoom because they can receive a public link that's posted somewhere. So you want to be very conscious about where this information is shared. So for example, our fair boards are having lots of meetings to discuss county fairs right now. On their website, it says something like, the next scheduled meeting is Wednesday evening at 7. If you would like to attend, please email this person and they will send you the direct link and they will send you the password for that as well. And that's just really a good security step to have when you're having any online meeting. So for today, for example, you all receive the connection information and a unique password for today's meeting. Um, that's just really a best practice to make sure you're protecting yourself. And generally your chair of your meeting, your president, um, or maybe your vice president or your secretary is the one that's setting up that information and communicating it to the people that are going to be involved. So again, you wanna think about that in advance. How are you sending this out? If you are publishing your meeting information in a local paper, again, you don't wanna be publishing that connection information in the paper, but have a blanket email that can go out to people that are interested in, a, in attending that meeting. So know your rules. And the next part we're going to talk about, Morgan's going to talk about how to get there, how to prepare for your meeting and some of the responsibilities and things to think about. So before you can jump on to your meeting, you do need to schedule it just like you would schedule a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, and then the, also you want to have your agenda, again, as you would for your traditional face-to-face -face meeting. Um, you want to have a consistent meeting agenda. So, you know, Typically, if you're meeting regularly with a board or committee, you have your uh, your agenda that you work on monthly, and you know that you add your new business, you have your old business, um, committee reports, so on and so forth. And be consistent in that. One thing that I would recommend is to send the agenda in advance with the connection information, and also send any reports that you might have, such as if you have financial reports or other documents that need to be shared, I would encourage you to send it all in one email and also send all the reports as one PDF document. So if you have items that are in Microsoft Word or Google Docs or you have pictures, um, try to combine those files together into one document in Adobe or using Microsoft Teams. So that way there's only one attachment that you're meeting participants are using and um, and if you know other things you could do is just in in word you could post you know merge all those documents together as well so definitely try to keep that on one um, email I had uh, a meeting last Wednesday with our fair board and prior to that I think I got four separate emails with attachments so being able to participate in that meeting was a little challenging to have all of these different attachments from different emails, um, you know, and if you can't combine them into one, the next best thing I would say is have all the attachments on one email. So it's only one place to look. Um, but when you're sending the agenda and other pertinent documents for it, also include a dial-in number as well as the meeting ID and password. Some people might not have the ability um, whether it's the techno technological ability or just the ease of access to be able to use a computer or a smartphone to be able to connect the way that many of us are connected today. And they might only use a phone. I know um, sometimes I have, um, last night I had a meeting and some of my um, volunteers were still in the field. So instead of being on their Wi-Fi, they just called in on, on the phone number and 
they were able to participate in the meeting last night through that. So that is an option as well. Um, the other thing is even though you send those documents as an attachment, I would encourage you to also utilize the share screen feature, which we're doing right now so that you can see our PowerPoint, but share the reports and the agenda as a PDF on the, on the screen so that others can view it as well. Again, if you have um, folks that might not have the ability to, um, to print the items or to have their items open and participate in the meeting, and so they might just feel better having that on the screen to follow along with as well. Um, and then the other thing that I will add with that, oftentimes I see where people might share maybe the, um, the meeting on the, um, on the agenda is, uh, um, jotting down that note, thanks Bill. Um, but sometimes the meeting agenda might be in Microsoft Word and oftentimes when you pull up a Word document on your screen, the default Zoom might be at 60%, but when you're looking at it, if you were to take your arms and cover the sides of your screen, that's about what it would show you. And so some of us with eyes that might be a little older than the rest of us um, <laughs> might have trouble viewing that. So I'm always the person in a meeting that says, can you zoom in on that? And so zoom in so that it, it utilizes the whole screen in front of you. Um, your participants will greatly appreciate that. Um, I know I would if I was participating in your meeting. Um, so that's what I would say about that. And then also um, identify a host who is typically your chair and then a co-host, not a co-cost. But the co-host um, is, is really helpful in being able to do a couple of different things for you. The co-host can monitor the chat. So as I'm talking, Jen is able to monitor the chat and see if there's any questions and such um, that come up that need attention. And when she's talking, then I'm able to take over that role. Um, you know, if there's attendance that you need to take for your board meetings or other meetings, you, you have someone that's able to do that. And then also one of the features that Zoom has, and I'll talk about this more a little bit later, is a waiting room. And so if you decide to utilize that feature, you would want someone to be able to admit people to the waiting room. Um, you know, once your meeting starts at seven o'clock, it's really hard to, to dual focus on what you're discussing as far as your agenda, and then also to sit there and admit people and make sure that they're supposed to be participating. Um, so having that second person that can manage that is really helpful. And then also to be able to handle any general troubleshooting. So. Um, you know, yeah, and also as the co-host, if, if there was an emergency and you needed to leave the meeting, the co-host can continue running the meeting without the meeting having to close, which is really important as well. The other thing I guess I just wanted to reference here too is don't forget according to your bylaws when the agenda and the reports need to be sent out. So in some organizations, it's five days, it's three days, it's one week, whatever the best practice or the requirement is for your organization, make sure that you are following suit with that and sending out that agenda or that meeting reminder as well. Absolutely. So uh, some things to think about is, um, you know, just like your face-to-face -face meeting, you would want to think about how is the room being arranged. Here, you have different considerations to make. And so one of them is, um, do you want to use a presentation or a webinar? platform versus a meeting. And so just to clarify what some of those differences are, meetings are designed to be collaborative events with all participants being able to share the screen or turn on their video and audio and see who else is in attendance. So right now, um, if Bill wanted to share his screen, he could hit share screen and it would notify me as the host that he's requesting to have that privilege. And so I would be able to allow him to do that. Um, you know, here, while you're all muted, you have the ability to unmute yourself and participate at any time. And in the chat box, you can see that, um, you know, anyone is able to participate in the chat. Um, if you needed to send a message to an individual, you could do that as well. And so there's different features for that. Webinars, on the other hand, are designed so that the host and any designated panelists 
can share their video, their audio, and their screen. Um, but webinars allow view-only attendees. So for example, if this session was more of us just talking to you and not interactive and you know allowing that two-way conversation, um, but just for you to view, that would be set up as a webinar. Um, they have the ability to interact via a question and answer or chat and then also answering polling questions. But the host, um, with that, the host can also unmute the attendees. Uh, another difference is that in a webinar, the attendees cannot rename themselves as well. So, um, you know, there, there is a difference. Most often you would probably be looking at using a meeting, but um, the webinar is another option. And then also with a webinar, uh, I believe you're allowed to have more attendees with that, with that setup. So just some things to consider. We've, um, the other thing is, um, you know, you wanna choose your platform and there's a number of them out there. So we listed a couple, some other ones you may have heard of or even worked with is um, go to meeting, Zoom, et cetera. And then uh, there's also Microsoft Teams and Microsoft Teams is, is the rising platform while Skype for business is being phased out. Um, and, and then WebEx is another one, Google Meet, which some of you may have known as Google Hangouts. I feel like when all the COVID-19 started happening that um, that's around when Google Meet came about. And then also there's the free Zoom account, which some of you might have, and that has some limitations as well. Um, you're limited to 40 minutes. Uh, Google Meet is limited to 60 minutes with the free version, but for a free Zoom account, plans start at $15 and we're no way um, endorsing Zoom or anything. It's just that's the platform that OSU uses and in my opinion and also the opinion of several of my 4-H advisors, they found it to be well worth that $15 to have some of the additional features um, and extended time. We have no time limit with the paid account. So, you know, I would think about that as, um, you know, something to consider, even if you're looking to just have the paid account for the time that we have these social distancing guidelines in place. Um, it might be a good investment depending on the size of your board and the length of a typical meeting. If you meet for two hours and you're trying to host with a 40 minute limitation, it gets a little challenging and maybe even frustrating too. But um, those are just some of the different ones. And I, um, yeah, the, it's $15 per month um, is where it starts. And uh, when we share this information later, I did find what I found to be a nice link that shares um, that shares some of those uh, um, like the pros and cons of each and the ease of features for some of these different platforms. So I think it's important to um, you know do some of your own research to see if there's something else that might work better for you. but um, because of our familiarity and also the popularity of Zoom, we are focusing on that specific platform as we share some of the features today. But in general, um, a lot of these features might be available on some of the other platforms too. So here, this um, I know this might be a tiny font, and so this slide I think is will be more helpful once we share the um, the PowerPoint with you. But this goes through the step by step instructions on how to sign up for that account and uh, and how to set up your first meeting. Uh, so uh, again, I'm not gonna read through this, but on the next slide, I'm gonna take you through the steps with uh, some detailed instruction or some uh, screenshots for that. So this is what Zoom looks like. Some of you might be familiar. When you um, go to the website, it's just zoom.us. And from there, if you already have an account or a Google account or Facebook, you can sign in or you can sign up for an account here. So you would just type in your email and password and sign in. Um, or, you know, as I mentioned, you can select sign in with Google or sign in with Facebook if you'd like. And then from there, you're just gonna click the button that says schedule a new meeting. And so you 
once you click that button, you'll have the ability to give your meeting a name, to set the date and time of the password or of the meeting, and then here you can decide if you would like to have a password or not. And you can also customize it. So when you are scheduling a meeting, it generates a meeting ID automatically, or it gives you the option to use what's called a personal meeting ID. And that is something you can also customize that as well. Um, and that's something if anyone has your meeting ID, they can go in ahead of, you know, ahead of time or whenever they'd like. The other thing is with the password, um, you can also, you can customize that too. So the password for today is, um, is generic, you know, it was auto-generated, but if you wanted to create something specific, you know, uh, if you have a meeting on Wednesday and you want it to be ODNRWEB, you could, um, you could do that. So it, you know, there's some options there uh, for the customization. You can also enable some options such as joining before host. And so if that option is enabled, then you would be able, to, your participants, just like if you were meeting at the library, could walk in at any time. Um, but if you wanted them to wait, they would be sitting there, their screen would say, your meeting will begin when, when the host starts the meeting. Um, and then you'll save the meeting. And then from there, you want to invite your participants. So there will be a summary screen that pops up and you are able to copy the meeting invitation and then put it in your Outlook um, or your email provider. You can also connect Zoom to your email. So when you schedule the meeting, it pops up with your calendar and um, you can invite attendees. So then, um, from there, you would select start, or if your meeting is later, then your meeting will be saved, and then when it's time to start that meeting at a later date and time, you'll have that ability to do so. So there's just a lot of options in here as you go through. You can determine if, um, if your participants, when they join, if they're if their sound will be on, if their camera will be on, if your sound and camera as the host will be on or not. Um, I always prefer to have my camera off. You just never know what moment it's going to catch you when you come on. So um, I always prefer to have the camera off. Uh, the other thing with that is, is if you have bandwidth troubles, it, having the camera on will slow that, down your bandwidth. So um, I always for me, I default to having it off for everyone, and then you can choose to turn it on if you would like. Um, and same with the sound. I, you don't want someone joining a meeting and they're in mid-yell to their children to be quiet. Um, so I always do the sound as well. So just looking at some of the comments that are in here um, in the chat as Morgan was talking and we will again make sure that you guys get all the materials at the end. We didn't want to bombard you before we started. And then I know some of you had said, I didn't have to put in a password when I joined. So how does that work? Um, sometimes the password is embedded in the link. So if you click di directly on the link and you, you, you have used Zoom before, it's going to take you right to it without asking you for that password. So it's always good to send the password in case that's not the circumstance with the people that you are working with. Um, however, if they have that direct link and they can just click on it, most of the time it's embedded for just you know, for everybody to use a little bit easier. The other thing is um, your, the password that's auto-generated is a numerical password. If you choose to have a word, um, it will take that word and assign numbers to it. So if, you are, if you're logging in from a phone to the meeting, you aren't gonna spell it out, you know, by hitting five, three times to get to that letter. It's gonna take that word and turn it into numbers for you. So that's what you would enter in the, um, when it asks for that password. So are there any questions to this point before we get into virtual etiquette and using online meetings a little bit more? Okay, feel free to post those in the chat. Morgan will monitor those. So we're gonna, oh, go ahead, Bill. Can I make a comment? Sure. I don't know how many of the participants have used Zoom very much. This talk might be overwhelming if you have never used Zoom. 
Zoom is a really easy program to use. This, if you just remember small fractions of today, you'll be quickly become an expert Zoom user. Yes, thanks, Bill. And we, we will talk about some tips to help ease that comfort with this platform too. Yeah, so now we're gonna start talking about some of the features that are available to me and get you a little bit more comfortable with using Zoom. Um, because like Bill said, it can be very overwhelming, but there's a lot of cool features once you start to play with a, a little bit more. So we just want to express that, you know, we think it's really important, like with anything, when you jump on to get comfortable with what you're doing, learn the controls, learn the video settings, especially if you are hosting a meeting or you're co-hosting with someone. So one of the resources that we will send out and we will send to you has more detail and step-by-step -step guide as to how to use Zoom, how to set up Zoom as a host, how to join as a guest, and some of the features that we're gonna show you as well, the chat box and the reaction icons and some of those other things. So it's just really important, especially as if you're doing any presentation or any meeting, when you come face to face, you're gonna set up your space, right? You're gonna put out your chairs, you're gonna put out your flags, you're gonna set the table, you're gonna have the agendas out for folks. So practice in advance, explore some of the features and troubleshoot with different things before you dive right into it because it can be a little quirky. Um, there's been different times where we send the links out to folks and they can't get on. For whatever reason, there's static in the lines or you know, there's other things that are happening virtually that are preventing people from joining. So you wanna make sure that you can help them to troubleshoot and problem solve that. Restart your computer, um, shut off Zoom and start it again so that they have all of the features that are there. And we know that technology is not perfect and sometimes our internet goes down or sometimes other features just don't work for us on certain days. But if you can get comfortable with those a little bit in advance or you know who to go to, if that's Bill, he's one of our you know, Zoom or virtual meeting experts here, or you reach out to someone else, text someone and they can help you troubleshoot um, or Google it if you're comfortable doing that as well and figure out those different features and figure out some of those problem solving things. So we're gonna talk a little bit kind of about general etiquette when you come on to a meeting. You guys all look really great today. Um, some of you don't have your cameras on, some of you have fun different backgrounds. So when you come into a meeting, like Morgan said, you wanna come in with your video off and your audio off. A good host is going to already have that established for you. It's one of the meeting settings when we're setting it up. One of the boxes that we can check is allow participants to enter with their video off and their audio off. Just makes everybody feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, as Anne said before, she's heard my kids running around here, you know, over the last couple months while we've been touching base. And so to do that on a Zoom, it's important to give yourself that time to prepare. Uh, the other nice thing, many laptops have um, a cover on the top of their screen. So I can shut off my camera just like that as well. And then I physically have to go and turn my camera back on before I can see all of you. Um, and you can see, or I should say you can see all of me. So entering with that video and audio off. The other thing that's really important is to self mute. So as we talked about, we have the ability as the host to mute all of the participants. We can also make a choice in that same host privileges to not allow participants to unmute themselves. And again, that kind of goes back to what you're going for with your meeting or your webinar. Um, so it, when you are not actively speaking, it's really important to mute yourself to cut down on that background noise. And again, you never know, the dog's barking, there's kids in the house, your spouse comes home, whatever it may be. The other way you can do that is simply on your keyboard. If you're more of a keyboard person, you can hit Alt-A or you can hit the space bar on Zoom as well, and that'll help you to either shut off your video or shut off your audio, or you can click the little mute button in the bottom right-hand side of your screen. Um, the other thing that may be important for you is if you are in a formal meeting, is you may choose to ask people to raise their hand before they become unmuted. So if you have a lot of people and you have a co-host that can make sure um, that you know, everybody is muted and can be watching the participant list. When someone virtually raises their hand, if they have a comment that they wanna make or a discussion that they wanna add, they could be recognized by the chair and then they could unmute themselves or the host or co-host could unmute for them. 
So it is important to be involved in the conversation, of course, and then also being participating via your camera as well. Your camera shows that you have engagement in the meeting. It shows that you are committed to what is happening. Um, just like if you were in a meeting face to face, if you're constantly on your cell phone or constantly distracted by other things, it doesn't show that you're being engaged in the conversation and everybody wants to feel like they're part of it. So with that being said, if you do have to take a phone call, you do need to tend to something else. You need to use the restroom. Many of us have maybe seen the videos floating around online with people in virtual meetings and they take their laptop with them to the restroom. Make sure you shut off your camera. Um, make sure that you pause it so that you can take care of whatever you need to do, but be respectful of the people in the meeting or the people that are presenting. And be mindful to pause for those personal distractions, whatever they may be. Um, there's also some great virtual backgrounds like, like what we have available for us here today. So today I chose my 4-H wallpaper. Um, Morgan, this is Morgan's backyard with her goats that she was talking to or talking about before. Um, Bill is obviously down at a boat launch, which I'm very envious of, especially on a day like today. So you can <laughs> kind of pick and choose your virtual backgrounds. Um, and that is simply under your video tab. And I noticed Lola had the beach setting on, I think. I so you can play with different things as well. So here's our beach setting today. I would add, if you're choosing to use a virtual background, you know, just as Jenna spoke about being mindful of distractions in the background, I want to pull up what we have, um, some from Ohio State. And so. Like this one? This, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this one, while it's really fun, or even this, really fun, also really distracting. Um, yeah. So, you know, I would just say be considerate of your audience. And, um, you know, if you're, you know, if Jenna and I were meeting together and just having a fun conversation or, you know, just the two of us, it might not be a problem. But in this setting, I think you want to remain, um, you know, keep it professional, keep it, you know, not so distracting. The beach one, while it is a video, it's not it's not overwhelming in right. in the movement. Um, there's another video one. And the so, other thing to be very mindful of is what you're wearing and how that takes effect with the video or the background that you're choosing. Um, we have one colleague that she has very white hair. And so when she is in a background setting like this one, her hair dis disappears and she looks completely bald because of the background. So it's very distracting to the participants. Um, there's other colleagues that have images that are very large and it, it all just depends what you're comfortable with. So I would encourage you, or if you don't need a background at all, if your actual background behind you is not very distracting, um, that is something to consider as well. It, so just be mindful of what, especially if you are hosting the meeting, um, what else is happening behind you? Behind me is my husband's office. You know, there's lots of pictures on the wall. There's lots of other things happening. So I wanna make sure that I have a background that is set up. Um, so you may have to have some other features. I see that there's a comment in there about a green screen. Um, you shouldn't have to have a green screen on the bottom. You can hit either mirror my video or I have a green screen. If you have a green screen, that would be like, um, you know, your weather studio, for example, and then it's going to have other options for you. So you want to make sure that that box is not checked down in your virtual background settings. And you can, um, you can use your own pictures, um, you know, as Jenna mentioned, this picture is from my backyard, but then you could also, if you just wanted like a very neutral background, I think I just had Googled some images of, you know, of virtual backgrounds. And so I was able to find some, um, some neutral ones that, you know, I felt like I could use as well. And so you can import those into your, uh, into your, virtual background library. So there's a lot of different options available for that. Um, and it is something fun to play with. I know, um, I, who was it? Um, Adam had asked a bunch of questions. So one of them I will address now, since we're talking about virtual backgrounds. On the iPhone, you can do virtual backgrounds. And just like um, on here, 
which is not a good background for me. Well, you have to touch it. Here. Um, on the iPhone, when you have the this camera, when you have your Zoom app open, the camera that you would hit on there to turn your um, to turn your camera on and off, there is um, there is that Zoom option, and I know my kids were in their 4-H meeting last week on my phone and uh, using my phone and, you know, adding any picture they wanted to the background. They're precious. And you can have fun with those backgrounds too. Um, obviously, we're all working from home right now. So one thing that I've done is this happy birthday background for our colleagues. So when we're trying to celebrate someone's birthday, it's hard to do that virtually, but just doing something fun like that, that's oh, that kind of fun too. So yeah, make oh. sure you have the box unchecked that says I have a green screen. If you just want to use a standard picture that's there. Um, but yeah, I, the there is the virtual background option. Of course, I can't get into my meeting on my phone because this is my meeting login that we're using, but it's either under the camera or the like three dots on there. Um, it is it is an option and then it would pull from your gallery of photos that are on your phone then. Um, and so, so there are a lot of opportunities. The big thing with backgrounds, of course, is it's a nice thing to have to just kind of cut down on the distractions that are behind you. Um, the other thing you want to think about as it relates to camera usage is making sure that when you are on the camera, people can see what you're doing and if you are engaged in the conversation again, and that does show your participation level. So if you are multitasking, if you have small children, if you have animals around and other things like that, I know my, you know, my cat walks across my desk from time to time. Um, or you're doing other things. If you just have to listen to a meeting and you're working out, um, shut off your camera so that you um, are showing that you're engaged. And you can do that again by physically going down to the bottom and clicking stop video, or you can hit Alt B on your keyboard as well. Um, and sometimes the space bar works in the same way. Um, All there right, was so a question if we can demo demonstrate this. And I, I know that when I have tried to share the, uh, to share the meeting controls, um, it doesn't work so well. Let me see. Yeah, we can take some screenshots and yeah. we can send it to you guys so that you can get a better idea of what that I looks like I did make like a note well. of that to, to include, um, to include yeah. the screenshots. Um, so let's, Let's keep talking about some other kind of general etiquette things as well. We don't want to get too wrapped up in um, virtual backgrounds, but if you do have other questions, you can um, send those in the chat or email us afterwards and we can, you know, happily help you with some of those things too. Um, so on the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit more about some other etiquette things. So just like you were to show up to a meeting in person, um, it's good etiquette to be prompt, be on time, be prepared have your meeting reminder pulled up, have your agenda pulled up, have your notes ready, have a pen, whatever it is that you need. Um, be flexible, be patient with the changes, especially if you are new to Zoom or your host is new to Zoom or GoToMeeting or whatever platform you're using. Be flexible with those changes, be flexible with the fact that there may be lots of questions. I know when we first started this transition back in March and early April, it took 20 minutes for people to get on Zoom and get comfortable with Zoom and figure out how to unmute themselves and figure out how to participate. Um, remember to be presentable, wear appropriate clothing, just like you would to a regular meeting. So whether that is your uniform, your shirt, uh, whatever it is that shows that you're putting your best foot forward for your organization. So, a lot of times we jump onto meetings quickly or keep that camera off if you can't. If you haven't got your shower in yet this morning or you're still walking around with your towel in your hair, keep your video off. Make sure to reduce those distractions. Again, um, connect to Zoom or connect to your meeting in a quiet, organized space. Where is your office that you're working from or your backyard, whatever it may be. Um, but again, be mindful of the other distractions and other things that are happening. Make sure your cell phone's muted. Um, that can be really distracting to presenters if they hear your phone go off or to yourself as well. 
And similarly, make sure your email is off. Uh, right now with us working from home, we are also using our phones through our computers. And if we don't set the settings correctly, the phone will continue to ring through our computers, through our Skype phones right now. So be really mindful of shutting off those email reminders and other distractions, other videos that you might have that could distract you from presentations in your meeting. Sit still, don't spin in your chair. Don't fiddle around. Um, I know with our 4-H club meetings, I have a clover bud, which are the little guys, and he's six years old, and he just loves the spinning chair in mommy's office, and that can be very distracting to other people. So we, sit still. Don't rock in your chair, and just be mindful of that. We have a, a regular meeting with our 4-H professionals and, and some of our leaders across the state every week, and there's a few folks that, and I don't blame them, like to utilize their this hour Zoom time that we have on Friday to get their workout in. But the um, sometimes all we see is, because they're on the treadmill and they want their camera on. And we're really glad that they're working out, but this is really distracting. And I mean, I, I'm, I've done it too, where I wanna, you know, that hour Zoom time is the best time for me to get my bike ride in on a stationary bike. My camera is off, nobody needs to see me working out or you know, the head bobbing kind of stuff, or some people like to get their steps in, in place while they're on a Zoom. And, you know, those kinds of things are just as distracting too. So I would also encourage you to turn that off. And then the other, I was going to add something else in here. Um, now I don't even remember. I was something about the clothing. Oh, well, if you think of it. And remember, not everybody has a camera. And if you do access it from your phone or from a landline, let's say, oh. you won't have the, you may not have those camera abilities. And if your internet is really spotty, the first thing you want to do, and I know we mentioned this later as well, is to keep your camera off. So the camera is not required. Yeah. The other thing I would add as far as distractions, I know sometimes like I might be outside and need to come inside. And so if you're transitioning you know, you're sitting in a chair right now, but you want to relocate to the couch, turn your camera off while you're in transition, because otherwise you'll get a lot of <laughs> this. Right. right. So, you know, just think about those kinds of things. It's okay to turn your camera off for a moment if, it, if that's all you need to relocate or readjust or, you know, do whatever. Um, my favorite thing, I think, is to see people like, you know, what do I look like in here? <laughs> <laughs> like it's a mirror. So, you know, try, try to check the mirror before you come in front of the camera. Um, and that way people don't see you picking and primping and stuff. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about some general troubleshooting things as well. So I saw some comments kind of popping up in the, in the chat about feedbacks and echoes, which is so important. You notice uh, Morgan and I both today have on our headphones here. They're not the most comfortable thing, in my opinion, but these wireless headphones work really great and they get the job done. The speakers that you have or calling in by phone are great as well. Um, just be mindful of what other people can hear on the other end. So if you can get a headset or headphones, those are really going to help you to have the best auto, audio quality and to cut out the background noise. Uh, the other thing to think about is if that if you are a household where you have multiple people joining the same conference call or the same Zoom or participating in the same meeting, there could be a lot of feedback. So make sure that one of your devices is muted um, or go in separate rooms, separate areas or join together. But just be very mindful that if you have multiple participants in one space, you're going to get that awful pitch. Not just muting feedback. yourself as a speaker, but turning your sound off on your computer. So as I mentioned, my kids had a 4-H club meeting last week, and they, they like to be on separate devices. Um, and so they know that they have to, one of them has to turn their sound off. Otherwise, when one person unmutes to talk, you hear the echo, you know, the double echo. So, you know, things to consider. And if you're a host, um, I know, you know, I struggle sometimes with always wanting to be that nice person, but it's not being rude to say, hey, Bill, can you mute yourself? Or, you know, to say to someone, uh, 
you might, you know, one of you might need to turn your sound off. I did it in a meeting a few weeks ago and it's not being rude. It's someone doesn't realize that there's a distraction um, that's, that's causing some feedback. And the other thing as a host, sometimes I could just look down the list and see who's unmuted and click mute. Um, and all of a sudden it's quiet again. Peace has been restored in, in our ears. So, you know, don't feel like you're being rude for that. And then also just to acknowledge, Jamie posted in the chat, you know, recognize that not everyone, um, not everyone might have the ability to have a camera and or a microphone based on the technology. So sometimes, you know, you might have to make sure that you are reading the chat so that those who don't have the ability to um, communicate through, through the microphone, that you're including them just as much through um, through the chat. And just because you can't see their lovely face doesn't mean that they're not actively participating. They might not have the ability to. Also, like if someone's driving and they're using their Zoom app, um, you know, again, if that phone is, you know, bouncing down the freeway, the, the picture that you're gonna see is gonna be quite distracting. So, you know, understand that people wanna participate. They just might have their own technology limitations causing them to not. Um, the uh, we'll talk in, in just a moment how to how to shut off the camera when we speak about the controls but if you it should be at the bottom of your screen is where your menu is of uh, your tools uh, and there's a camera icon and you, you just click that on and off and if there's a line through it it's off yeah and down there too, you can pick what your video settings and you can pick which camera if you do have multiple cameras on your device, front or back. Um, similarly with your audio, you can pick which microphone you're using. Is it your headset? Is it your computer? Uh, the other option is you could join via video on your computer and use your cell phone to connect as well for your audio. So let's say that you don't have speakers installed on your computer or you don't have a microphone on your computer. You can select multiple multiple devices if you'd like um, and make sure that you're getting the best quality for what you're trying to do. So some other things to think about, um, avoid the backlight. You wanna have the light in front of you. So I actually have a window here on the other side of my computer. If it's behind you, it's gonna make you glow. If you have a light next to you on the table, um, behind you, it's all gonna play with the camera settings. So just be very mindful of that. Um, I was on a church service over the weekend and it was very distracting. The pastor had glasses on and there was something behind it that was causing his eyes to look yellow and have spools. And it was very distracting to the participants that were involved. So those are the kinds of things that you wanna troubleshoot before you join. Um, or ask somebody when they first jump on, can you see me, can you hear me okay? How do things look? And again, if the bandwidth or the Wi-Fi is an issue, you can shut off your video um, and that does help the connection. The other thing that you might find is that the host may shut off everybody's video to help with some of that stability as well or shut off all of the cameras so that um, everybody can have the same experience. All right, are there troubleshooting questions? Morgan, how's our chat look before we roll uh -huh. into um, participation and voting here in our last 10 minutes. Yeah, so Adam was posting, he can't find the virtual background. I'll, um, Adam, when we send our follow-up email, I can do some screenshots from my iPhone that we can include for you, okay? All right. Making that note. Okay. So as Jenna said, I'm going to talk about some, some ways to um, participate and, uh, and do voting. So there's some different options here. The first thing is you want to make it official. So you want to follow Robert's rules of order. Um, and so hopefully everyone's familiar with those, you know, already utilizing those in your meeting settings. Also, make sure that you are documenting meeting attendance and business in the secretary's minutes. And so the secretary should be, you know, following their, um, you know, their normal tasks as they would in that in-person meeting by doing roll call, 
and then jotting down the minutes. The other thing that you can do is record the meeting, such as we're doing today. And what that does, it allows you to capture both spoken and written components. So I think one of Adam's questions was, um, or some, I think it was Adam's question, was about recording the chat. When we conclude this recording, everything in the chat will be um, included as a file as well. So we can go back through the chat and make sure that we address every question that's asked um, and comment that we receive. And um, also be mindful that ev everything that is put in the chat is captured when it's recorded. And then the other advantage of recording the meeting is it's available for verification if needed. So sometimes meetings might, someone might do a, um, a recording that might get transcribed later on. And this kind of serves in that same way where you, if you, you know, maybe the secretary missed something in the minutes, she could, or he could go back and listen or watch the recording and be able to capture that. Um, so there's, a, there's some importance in those details as well. The, um, the recording, so what will happen is when I started this recording, it gave me an option to record it to the cloud or to record it to the computer. I've never actually done record to the cloud. I always just record to my computer and it saves it to the file where my Zoom program is. When the meeting ends, when I click end meeting, then what will happen is it automatically will start converting that, this recording into a into a couple of files. One, there will be a file with the text of the chats, and then there's also going to be an MP4 file, which is a video file, and there's also a file that's just the audio. So there's a couple of different files that'll be created and automatically saved onto a folder on my computer, unless you, of course, choose the cloud option. But then what I do, for example, every Monday I meet with my volunteers and I record those meetings and I put it into a folder that uh, that our volunteers can access online so they could just go straight to the video and watch it if needed. Um, and so you'll see when we share this today, um, I believe we'll just be sharing a link so that for, to that file with the video so you'll be able to click it and view it. Um, and depending, you know, we have that ability to make it so you can download it just based on our sharing, but you can always um, share and, you know, allow people to download that as well. So, it is something that you can save and go back to. It's not saved to this program necessarily, but you can save it to your right. computer. You can designate where it automatically goes to your download file folder, and then you can decide from there where it goes. And if you want to be super fancy, you can edit it with things like Adobe Rush and some of those other platforms um, as well, and cut and add and voiceover if you wanted to do that too. We don't do all that fancy stuff though. <laughs> <laughs> so here, um, these are some tools for participation, and this is the toolbar that you would see if you are hosting the meeting. So if you look at your controls, there's probably several more options up here. The, um, just to go across, it, on the left is your microphone, and so the microphone allows you to mute or unmute yourself, and if you click the little carrot, that little arrow next to it, then you have the ability to choose different um, microphones. So if, you know, if you're using a headset, the system would know that and it would ask you if you want to use your headset microphone or if you want to use the computer microphone. And likewise, with the, um, your, uh, when you're picking those, not only is it your microphone, but your speaker. So for example, I could listen, you know, use the speaker on my computer, but the microphone on my headset, for example. So you can, you know, choose what works best for you based on your ability. And then the video camera there where it says stop video, that's where you would turn your camera on or off. And so with both of those buttons, mute and stop video, if you click it, there will be a red line across it and that's going to tell you that it's turned off. So, um, you know, right now if you hover over your controls, a lot of you should see one or both of those. And then that little carrot next to that camera video is where the um, virtual background is as well. So that's where you can access those options. Um, security would just show you the, um, the password and the meeting connection. Clicking on participants opens up um, a box which shows you who is in the Zoom meeting. And then um, it also has some other controls that I'll get to on the next slide. I'll talk a little bit more about those. But you can see all the participants there who are present. 
and then um, the polls is the next button and I'm going to address that on a separate slide as well. The chat, I see many of you have found the chat feature. Um, the chat is, is where everyone can type messages and you can send it to everyone or send privately. Just understand that if the video is being recorded, all those private chats are also being recorded. And then you can also share files within the chat um, and that's an option too. And then if you click on uh, more or three dots, there's um, some additional features as well, such as um, recording, you can use breakout rooms, which breakout rooms are not a feature that's available in the free version of Zoom, but it is in the paid version. And so breakout rooms are great if you need to break into subcommittee meetings or you need to break into executive meeting during a regular board meeting. And so you would be able to pull just your executive committee into a breakout room and put everyone else in another breakout room. Um, so there's different ways that you can utilize that. If you're you know, teaching a session and want people to work in small groups on a, on a task or an activity, you can use breakout rooms for that as well. And then um, closed captioning is um, another option. And to utilize closed captioning, you either need to have somebody do the typing or you would do the typing, or the other option is, is to utilize a third party uh, closed captioning program. And then leave would allow you to leave the meeting and end is where you can end the meeting for all. And so that's the red button there. So if I were to click end, it would ask me if I wanna leave the meeting or if I wanna end the meeting for all. So here, this is, there's there some more participation options and these are great to use for some of those voting features. So just to, um, to give everyone that chance, while we're in this uh, meeting, if you have the ability to go into your controls and um, click on reactions, go ahead and click either the clap or the thumbs up. So go ahead and try that. So if you were doing a vote, you could say all those in favor, thumbs up. everyone see that? Uh, yes, Arlene, the breakout rooms and closed captioning are only on the host screen. Lola said yours isn't working. Hmm. So make sure you go down to the bottom where it says um, participants. And the other thing, so if you click on participants, um, the you have a couple extra options there. So there, and you can see these images here. The on the on this slide that you're looking at, the image on the left is what you would see as the host and the image on the right is participants. So there's just a slight difference between the two. Um, right. The, I'm like, which is the difference? Oh, because participants can raise their hand. I wouldn't need to raise my hand because I'm the host. Correct. And so if you look at either in your participant box, like I see, uh, Lori gave a thumbs up, Liz gave a thumbs up. Uh, you know, there's a couple people doing claps if you need a break or, you know, Jenna was talking about if you have to step away to, um, to the restroom, that maybe you would click on the clock there, which the clock is a symbol for away. Um, you know, if you stepped away from your computer. So that way I wouldn't say, um, you know, Mike has a, his camera off and I wouldn't sit here and say, hey, Mike, what do you think about this? Mike, Mike, are you there? And so instead of that, um, you know, Mike could put click away and I would know he's not around right now to answer my question. Um, or if you need a break, you know, you could click that as well. So there's some options. And then also with voting, you could just utilize the yes or no button. So you could say, 
All those in, in favor say yes, or all those in favor say no. And if you look in the chat, um, or in the participant box, I'm sorry, you can see you know, who's clicking what symbols. Um, and as a host, we get the little numbers right above, so we can automatically see. We don't have to go through and count. So I can tell you right now there's seven yeses and three noes. Right. And then so uh, as the host, I have the vote. ability to clear all. So those, I think, are really nice and easy ways to say, you know, to take the vote. Um, you know, it's quick and easy. And then when the vote is done, I can just hit clear. You also have the ability to clear as well. Um, so it, the last thing. Uh, are for pay only. Your thumbs up and thumbs down should be there in the free account, I believe. Um, yeah. Some of the other things, some of the poll features and some of um, the other things like closed captioning, I saw that that was a question before, that's under the host privileges. It all depends on the version that you have as well. So we can set that. Um, and there was another part of that question. Um, so with polls, polls are another great way to do voting along with other um, activities too. And so with polls, you, I would encourage you to set it up in advance. It does allow you to do it on the fly. Um, can a person vote without a camera? If they're on the computer or sure. a smartphone, yes. On the phone, I don't. I I don't think so. I think they would just have to verbalize their vote. Um, for polls, here. Um, so I have a poll set up, and as the host, I just clicked launch poll, and so I know that there are sixty attendees. And so if you would go ahead and vote, um, this shows you what the participant sees when they vote. And on my end, I can see the number going up. I know 40% have voted, 46, 50. Um, and so with this, there's also a time on it. So if you were to say, you know, we're gonna spend about one minute on this, or you can watch till you have 100% of the votes in the, um, I was doing this last week for a quality assurance session and some people had some trouble with the vote and so they would just private message me their response. I was doing it in a quiz format for an activity and um, without a camera. So to vote without a camera, you can utilize the chat um, and you should be able to have the features of the yes or no or um, right. thumbs up. So, And the nice thing about this poll feature is this is completely anonymous. So you can set it up if you want it to be anonymous or not. But right now, we don't know who has so, responded to the poll as well. So here, I can share the results. And then on my screen, I have the option to stop share. And I can also relaunch the poll. Um, Anne-Marie, do you have two screens by chance? Some people didn't see this. Let's go ahead and relaunch it again. Okay. Sometimes um, if you have a pop-up blocker established on your computer, if you're using the web browser version, that may be a limitation that you have. Um, also, if you're using your cell phone to connect, it may pop up and then go away pretty quickly. Um, it just depends on the device that you're using. So you wanna be mindful as well of that. And of course, if you're on the phone, as Morgan mentioned, you're not gonna be able to respond to a poll that way. But what I generally do is ask people to put it in the chat in a message to me privately if they want to share. Um, so that way they're not feeling like they are singled out in their response that they are giving. Okay, so let me try this. So if I stop sharing the PowerPoint, do you see the poll now? Nope. Interesting. Huh. 
I don't know. It may be a setting of the web browser. If you don't have the um, pop-up blocker, if you don't have the pop-up blocker, or if you don't have Zoom downloaded to your computer, if you're just accessing it through um, through like the web, through through Google or Chrome or Firefox, whatever web browser you're using, it may be a limitation of that as well. Interesting. And so with polls, if you were using this for a meeting where you needed people to vote yay or nay then you could set up your poll, just one poll that says yay or nay, and then, um, and then it, you wouldn't have to have multiple polls. You could always just relaunch the poll again for your different votes. So that's one way you can do it. Another thing you could do if, um, if you weren't quite comfortable with, with this is you could also, do um, you know all those in favor? Give me a thumbs up, and then to sit there and count. And that's how our um, our fair board sometimes does it too. Is is where it would just you know counting the thumbs up uh, as opposed to doing a roll call. You know, when you've got multiple, you know, in a meeting like this, that would be really hard to do. And so um, you know, so you could say if you don't have the controls, just do a. a you know, use your real actual hand and, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down. And I saw Michael put in the chat there, um, sometimes when Zoom does push out a new update, some of the things do change, they do shift a little bit. So I would encourage you if um, to, to make sure you have the most current version of Zoom. They just rolled out a new one with some new security features, I believe last week, 5.3. And so sometimes if you don't have the most recent version or you haven't gone, to zoom.us, it doesn't carry over some of those settings. But these are all things we wanted to kind of make you familiar with today to help you think about before you host your next meeting as well. And so earlier, um, when Jenna was speaking about getting comfortable with Zoom, one thing that I would encourage you to do, one, if you have Zoom, just the program, you could always start a meeting, go into the program, start a meeting, and it could just be you and you could play around with some of these features. The other thing is, is you could phone a friend and say, hey, Jenna, do you have a few minutes I could try a poll just to, you know, try my own comfort? The other thing that I would recommend um, is, you know, and our fair board did this, we have uh, a decent number of, um, you know, some folks who aren't as comfortable with computers and with technology. And so before having our first Zoom board meeting, hosted a practice meeting. So all those who weren't comfortable or who had never used the platform before could join a meeting and then work through these controls and, and features before actually having the meeting to utilize them. And so I would also encourage that as an option if you're changing platforms to this, to, um, you know, to have a practice meeting, whether it's a week ahead, a day ahead, or even an hour ahead, um, you know, just offer an opportunity so that those that are less comfortable could, um, could have some practice time, so. So we know we went over a little bit, so we'll open it up for questions right now. And as we mentioned, um, I did put a couple files in the chat box and we'll make sure that those are in a folder for all of you with the recording with some other um, a copy of the PowerPoint and some other information as well. So uh, we'll take a couple questions. I know we've answered a lot along the way, but we do want to be mindful of your time. It's just after 11. So are there any burning questions? You can put them in the chat or you can unmute yourself if you're comfortable doing that. I'm not seeing any, Morgan. Thank you for your kind words. The other thing that I want to add is you will also be receiving a, an email tomorrow from uh, Brian Butler, and that is going to include what's called a triple EP, which is an evaluation of our teaching. And so we would just ask that you complete it. It's an online survey, and you can just go through and 
um, if you have any comments or anything, that would be wonderful. And um, that's something that helps us in our teaching and our performance. So look for that. And again, we'll put that in our email that we send later today too. And I saw one question in here regarding headsets. Um, I know I have a wireless Logitech set. I don't know, Morgan, what are you using today? Um, <clears throat> I actually don't have my headset on. It's just my crazy curls that you see. But um, mine is Zone. I'll have to send it. I am happy to send it. I absolutely love my headset. And um, yes, Adam, we will go through the, uh, the chat with, uh, when we address them in our email as well. The, um, the headset that I have, I do love a lot of the features with it. Um, the, some of the, um, I can flip the microphone up and down and that'll mute me or unmute me, which is really nice. And um, it has their noise canceling. So when I'm listening, I don't hear the background noise in my house and stuff. It's, it's really nice. I'm happy to share that link and highly recommend it. So um, good question though. All right. Well, Great. So be looking for follow-ups from us and we'll go through the chat and answer any other questions that we might have missed. And uh, if you guys have any questions, our emails are there on the screen. So we thank everybody again. And thanks, Anne and ODNR for helping us set up today's presentation. Yeah. And we'll make sure that you guys can share the material and the recording as well. We'll give you the information for that. Yes. All right. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank All you, right. everyone. Enjoy the day. Enjoy the weather. It's beautiful. <laughs>